As you know, storytelling has been my big purview for 20 years now. And you can see how people are really starting to get it, that if you have a report that's just heavily chart-based or you know facts and figures or presenting conclusions up front, you're giving away the ending. What you want to do is entice people with a protagonist. Recovering journalist, book author, and documentary filmmaker Evan Schwartz works at the intersection of storytelling and innovation. He's what we would call a thought leadership master craftsman. Evan cut his storytelling teeth as a business technology reporter, editor, at publications such as Computer Systems News, Business Week, and MIT Technology Review. He later served as a contributing writer for Harvard Business Review, The New York Times, USA Today, The Boston Globe, and American History. Over the last three decades, Evan has written six nonfiction books, including Last Lone Inventor, A Tale of Genius, Deceit, and The Birth of Television. Moreover, Evan has produced, written, or appeared in documentary films that aired on Netflix, Showtime, PBS, History Channel, and Nat Geo Channel. Evan is currently working as a freelance research editor at InnoLead, a members-only content and community services provider. He's also written a screenplay for a feature film on the climate crisis that he's shopping to producers as we speak. Today's conversation will cover how and why thought leadership is a must-have in every company's go-to-market strategy, Evan's evolution as a technology journalist to book author to management consultant storyteller to filmmaker, the role of books in today's thought leadership landscape, and how budding thought leaders and thought leadership professionals should approach career advancement. Okay, Evan, thanks for joining us on Everything Thought Leadership. It's a pleasure, Alan. Well, let's start with the state of thought leadership. I think that's an interesting area and its importance in the corporate marketing mix. It seems to us that every company in almost every sector wants or needs to convey its problem-solving expertise to win the hearts and the minds and the pocketbooks of its target market. You've been around here almost as long as I have. How has the profession changed since you entered the space? And how do you see it to progressing in the near term? Well, as you know, Alan, we both started in the world of journalism. So, and before the internet, really, there were some rarefied publications. Um, I was at Business Week, um, but essentially, there's a glut of information online, and journalism is just overwhelming. Thought leadership is to be able to show what are the actionable insights? How do you make sense of everything that's being re reported? And what are you going to do to take the information and use it for your business and for your life? Absolutely. No question about that. But how has it changed since you came on board? I mean, in, in the early days, I think there was this you know, kind of focus purely on longer form reports and still very important in the overall marketing mix. But today you've got a variety of vehicles to, to provide thought leadership points of view that represent a company's expertise and problem solving abilities and drive, you know, recognition in the marketplace and hopefully business as well. How has it changed from the time that you got started here? I, well, I think attention spans are getting shorter and people are, don't have as big an appetite for longer form reports. Uh, essentially, if they're reading something on their computer screen, uh, the format I prefer these days is like a PowerPoint presentation that's very heavily graphics oriented. So each page gives you one big insight that's illustrated and makes an impression. And then you go to the next page. And there's no, um, there's no limit to how many pages you could have a longer report. You could have a 50 page report that is pleasurable to scroll through um, rather than sort of a sit back reading experience on a sofa. I think most people are reading now on their, on their laptops. Sometimes it's on their phones. So you, you really need to make it work. Um, visually for a, a smaller screen as well. Absolutely. And, you know, something that's visually uh, exciting to look at is really important, no question about it. But you still need to have great storytelling and narrative that really brings the facts and 
figures to life. I mean, in our view, very often you see a lot of these kind of PowerPoint-esque kinds of thought leadership reports, and they lack the voiceover. It's hard sometimes to kind of read meaning into what the, the what the data points say and how to interpret them. So I, I agree with you. It's very important. And I don't disagree also that the long form is, uh, is a challenge for a lot of people. No question about that. But I think if you make it visually stimulating and you weave in some great storytelling, it can be very powerful. And I think today in, in, in our very fact is optional world, people are looking for research driven insights, things that really show the evidence behind the point of view. And to me, this is important in the overall thought leadership mix when it comes to, say, B2B marketing. Do you have a point of view on that that you'd like to share? Well, sure. As you know, storytelling has been my big purview for 20 years now. And you can see how people are really starting to get it, that if you have a report that's just heavily chart-based or, you know, facts and figures or presenting conclusions up front, you're giving away the ending. What you want to do is entice people with a protagonist. It could be a new venture leader. It could be the company brand itself, if it's an iconic company, and present what those challenges are to the protagonist, um, what they're up against. So you get people invested in the story, and then you could take them to the conclusions and the takeaways, and it has much greater impact. So storytelling, which is adapted from movies and television, could absolutely apply to the business world. And I think that's what's really exciting about this field now. Absolutely. And the, the facts and figures then become the accent points, the proof points of the hypothesis or the point of view you're trying to share with your audience. And, you know, very often what we find, and I'm sure you've come across this as well, when you see reports that are just recitation of data, you know, here's all the data we collected and here's what we kind of think it means, but draw your own conclusions, please. Exactly. I just finished a project on venture capital, uh, corporate venture capital, and the standard industry report just starts out with these pie charts and uh, bar charts of, of all the deals. And it's, it's kind of overwhelming and not that interesting in my view. Yeah. I would rather take a company like we're focusing on Johnson & Johnson, Boeing, these are iconic brands, and what are they doing? And make the corporate venture capital leader into a character and show what they're up against and bring it all the way to the conclusion of launching a successful venture in the marketplace in healthcare or aerospace. That's, that's really exciting. I mean, venture capital, um, entrepreneurship really gets your adrenaline flowing if you tell that story correctly. Now, you know, we, we, we talked a little bit about how, you know, people sometimes get intimidated by longer form content, the form of reports at least, but you spent a lot of years writing books. So I guess my question is to you, in this ADD world that we live in, the attention deficit syndrome age, how do you put together a compelling book that is going to give people or inspire people to want to read and to stay with it and to glean as much insight and value from all the hard work you put into it? Well, I think it has to be based on a big idea. There's so many Me Too books out there. How many books about artificial intelligence are coming out now? And so many books on leadership and management and innovation uh, that you have to have something that distinguishes you. And I think, you know, one of the marquee books that we did at Insight with the partners at Insight is dual transformation. And that's a big idea that we pioneered through articles in Harvard Business Review. The idea that if you want to transform your company from one business model to another or one brand image to another, one product set to another, you really need to create two different processes. One is to adapt your current core business. The other is to launch new ventures that are outside your core 
And that's a completely different team, completely different set of insights. And it serves as a really useful framework. So we believe that was a big idea. And that kind of thought leadership was really valuable for Innosite growing the firm and for our thought leaders like our author, Scott Anthony. Um, we were just very pleased to see that that book helped propel him into the top ranks of thought leadership in the world to the point where he's in the top 10 on the Thinkers 50 list now. So it's big ideas that like that that can really get above the clutter. Can you talk a little bit about the ideation process and how that all came together and how you used HBR? I assumed you seeded the, the, the water or seeded the grounds a little bit with uh, the HBR articles to see how it was going to play. You didn't just launch out and write a book once you got your articles published, correct? That's right. You know, the the whole thing started with one of our board members named Clark Gilbert, who was uh, reinventing a newspaper in Utah and showing that you could still publish a newspaper, but you have to completely do it differently and reposition it. At the same time, you want to create a digital operation that's a completely different team, different business model, and you want to keep them separate. And the CEO has to arbitrate between these two efforts over many years. And that case study became a cornerstone of a Harvard Business Review article. We brought in other examples of other companies that have done this dual transformation. And it caught on to the point where we were collecting enough cases and stories and insights where it could become a book. And um, Scott Anthony really took charge as our lead partner and brilliantly wrote this book called Dual Transformation. And uh, it became a marquee framework for many of the um, engagements that the consulting firm did. And companies used it in their own language. So the thought leadership spread to our clients and they took off with it. And that's what we love to see where new language and a new way of thinking can really ripple out to the, to the global economy because some of these clients are some of the biggest companies in the world. Yeah, and, and when you spoke at our Profiting for Thought Leadership event last year, you made the point that uh, it had the 3X effect. It tripled revenue to 60 million for the company, tripled employees to 100 plus people, and the company was then acquired for triple the, uh, the, the revenue at $120 million. That's incredible return on thought leadership investment. Yeah, I think it's a proof point because as you know, in the consulting world, you often can't predict what your revenue is going to be three to six months from now because these are all monthly or short, shorter term engagements. But what endures is your ideas, your insights, your thought leadership. And that's essentially what was purchased, I believe. The impact we have, the impact stories, the ideas, the frameworks, and the legacy of someone like Clay Christensen, who was the co-founder of Innosite. As we know, disruptive innovation has become one of the great um, business frameworks and buzzwords, unfortunately, for our time. Absolutely. So why don't we fast forward a little bit and talk about your involvement with the book Speed and Scale, which you worked on with John Doerr and his team over at Kleiner Perkins. How did that come together and, and what, what role did you play in helping those stories be told? Well, after leaving Innosite, I started working for John Doerr, the legendary venture capitalist at Kleiner Perkins. And he has been famous for investing first in Amazon and Google, but he was very, very um, obsessed, you could say, with climate investing, um, starting in 2006, seven when he first saw the Al Gore documentary. He brought Al Gore in as a partner to the firm and started investing in these companies, learning so much about how to solve some of these gnarly problems in carbon emissions. So. I saw 
when visiting him in Silicon Valley, a binder on his desk about his venture investments and his plans for investing in policy ideas for uh, climate solutions. And I said, you have to write a book about this. You have to adapt your framework of um, objectives and key results, which was the, the centerpiece of his first book, Measure What Matters, which was a number one New York Times bestseller uh, on the business list. And he thought it was a great idea. So he put me to work with a team eventually on creating a global framework and a set of solutions and stories about how we can solve climate, the climate crisis, and get to net zero emissions by 2050. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great book. I mean, the framework in and of itself, while it is complex, it's easy to wrap your head around, very clearly presented. The book is very well designed. But to me, it's the, it's the entrepreneurs who are trying to go out and help solve this crisis. Those stories are really powerful. And you and the team did a wonderful job of really, really, really having an impact, showing that there is, there is a way to get there from here if we're hopefully stay the course. Yeah. And some of those stories are, they come out when you say, you know, what did you want to do when you, when you were a kid and when you grew up? How did that change? And when did you first have that epiphany that climate is, is the area that you want to spend the rest of your life on? Um, and everyone had that epiphany. It, it resulted in powerful stories. And these people are very driven. And we had, we had people starting the great climate companies now, um, startups like Sunrun and Enphase, but also people like Laureen Powell Jobs and people who have great fortunes and why they are investing, giving away all their money to solve this existential problem. So from a Kleiner Perkins perspective, how has this experience played out for them? Are they happy with the results? Have has this helped them to understand where they should be placing their bets or has it elevated recognition in the financial community and, and whatnot as to their commitment to helping to solve the climate crisis? I think so. I think they're known as um, marquee climate action investors, both on the technology and startup front, but also in the policy realm and basically getting the public engaged. So it's it's very exciting for them, but it's hard. I mean, for every advance, three steps forward, there's two steps back. It is brutal. I think we've had some influence in the policy realm. We know um, the book was endorsed on day one by Obama, by Al Gore, by John Kerry. We know senators read it, the Secretary of Energy read it. So we think the Inflation Reduction Act was partly influenced by some of our suggestions and frameworks in, in speed and scale. But it's, it's tough, as you know, we're not on track. And, but this message of speed and scale going big still resonates because we know how to solve climate, but if we do it by 2070 or 2080, it's not gonna make it much of a difference. We're going to have a runaway catastrophe. We have to do it on, on this time laid out by the scientists in the IPCC. So the, the book evolved into a website and I think a, a documentary film as well. How has uh, that process gone in terms of making sure you've got fresh content, fresh points of view? And how has it performed over time? Are, is Kleiner Perkins happy with the amount of visibility they're getting on these? Uh, related properties? I think so. I mean, the, the climate tracker that we did, which was based on the set of key results on, on the Speed and Scale website, got recognized by the World Economic Forum, various publications like Fast Company wrote about it. And it's really a, like a dashboard to see if we're on track for key goals. So I think everyone's really proud of that. And it's going to be... Um, the basis for more going forward, maybe a second ed edition of the book. Wow. Stay tuned, huh? Mm -hmm. And um, John Doerr is an absolute 
he's just just a great advocate for this. And he he made a huge donation to Stanford and started a climate uh, studies school, the first major new school at Stanford in in decades, one of the biggest donations to a university in history. And I think it's going to really have a lot of impact over a long time. Books can be rainmakers, as Evan revealed. Works such as Speed and Scale and Dual Transformation have been major door openers for John Doerr client Perkins and for Scott Anthony and his innovation consulting team at InnoCite. Research we conducted in 2022 with our partners for Anesis and Rattleback for our Profiting with Thought Leadership study shows the impact books can have and will continue to have on conveying eminence. Of the thought leadership consumers we surveyed, 54% said the form in which a firm publishes its thought leadership content boosts its credibility to an extremely high or high degree. So given the prestige of books, books can help a company stand out from the competitive set. That is, if a firm has a big idea worthy of a book and the process, discipline, time, and intestinal fortitude and funding to develop a great manuscript. Although print books may be considered counterintuitive in today's digital world, thought leadership producers across industries that we studied, tech, tech services, management consulting, legal, accounting, and staffing services, said they still have a formidable place in their thought leadership portfolio. In fact, 34% of the 163 thought leadership producers we surveyed said they use this medium to share their thought leadership. That was the second highest percentage after in-person conferences and seminar productions. Not surprisingly, self-anointed thought leadership leaders are more apt to use this medium than laggards. 42% of leaders said they publish books compared with 26% of laggards. So why don't we transition to other forms of storytelling, more mm-hmm. visual uh, forms of storytelling? I know uh, you've you've worked in documentary films on the in the past. You've written a, a, a screenplay on on the topic of of climate. Can you tell me a little bit about how, from a personal perspective, that transition has gone for you, and and why you've embarked on that journey? As you know, I've written books, historical narratives a book about the birth of television, a book about the original creation of The Wizard of Oz, biography of L. Frank Baum. So I moved to Los Angeles last year in 2022 in order to develop some of these for TV and movies. And I got inspired through my climate work to write a screenplay about climate solutions uh, we've never really seen a movie about climate solutions. So it's a cli fi climate fiction rom-com. And it's a form of thought leadership because I don't believe the public is engaged in solving climate. Everyone's cynical that it can be done. People are on the verge of panic and apocalyptic thinking. And, and I don't think... Um, television and film has really caught up or been ahead of this. And so I'm working with a producer. We're getting the script out. It already placed in uh, the Austin Film Festival competition. The film is called Sea Changers, and we're, we're hoping to, to get it made. Well, good luck with that. And we'll keep our eyes peeled. So, so given your perch at the intersection of innovation and storytelling, can't, can't not ask this question about the role and the impact of generative AI in storytelling, in thought leadership development, whether it's research, whether it's data analysis and synthesis, or whether it's actually writing something. What, what is your view on the role it will play and how is it going to play out? Well, I think generative AI is is an exciting area. I mean, there's a lot of misunderstanding. I don't think it's AI is going to achieve general intelligence anytime ever. Humans have to keep evolving and stay ahead of it. Sometimes I think we're devolving. So, but I think it's a great tool at at InnoLead, Innovation Leader, where I'm research editor now. Uh, Scott Kersner and the team has taken all the research reports we've done and all the knowledge and put it into a knowledge base so you can have a chat GBT interface 
and, and query it and ask questions. What's the best way to launch a new venture? And all kinds of things that involve improving the performance of innovation at companies. So I think you've, you've done something similar to that. And I think that's a really great tool to have. And so the, I, these specialized databases where you could um, query and really get intelligence is going to be essential because, as you know, it's, it's garbage in, garbage out. If, you, if there's plenty of things that you search on chat GPT that, that's misleading and that oh, outright wrong, outright wrong. So you have to be careful. And that's why I think there's a lot of AI leaders who are sounding the warning bells because like almost every technology from the past, it's, it's gotten ahead of us and it's, it's moving faster than we can understand it. So you don't see it as replacing human, creative, constructive thinking. You see it as a productivity tool that can help to maybe enhance or accelerate thinking and provide good inputs that can maybe stir and stimulate more uh, evolved perspectives on things. But still needs yeah. human oversight and it needs process governance, correct? Yeah, I mean, I recently uh, queried ChatGPT. Can you show me examples where AI has generated thought leadership? And um, it basically punted on that question. It says, we, we don't have any examples. Uh, this, we're only updated through 2021. And, but these are the firms that are selling these tools, which wasn't very helpful. And I don't think it could take the place of human thought leadership because no one wants to read sort of gobbledygook um, stuff that's regurgitated from that, that already exists. What we want are new insights, fresh insights, stories, and only human writers can do that. And we were discussing earlier in the Writers Guild strike, this was one of the issues. No one really wants to watch a movie or a television show written by AI. It's not going to be good. And we should not go down that road. Yeah, I would agree. I, I've uh, seen a lot of fairly decent writing from generative AI tools, but it just sounds like it's artificial intelligence. It doesn't sound like it's got a human empathetic perspective. It just seems like something going through the motions. That's right. And, they call it know, artificial for a reason. That's right. That's right. But I still still do believe it, it is a productivity tool. It can accelerate mm -hmm. and enhance a process for developing ideas. But can, it can only make, you know, good thinking a little better. It can't take bad thinking and make it good. You know, you got, you got to start with human insight and perspective. Otherwise, we're heading towards a, a, a very bad ending with this story. Mm hmm. Given your, your career arc, so what, what advice do you have for folks who are starting out in the thought leadership profession, if we can call it such? But what skills are going to be needed to succeed? Where can people find jobs and opportunities? And what kind of uh, sage counsel can you give them so they can achieve their, their ends? Well, I think almost any company that wants to differentiate in the marketplace needs thought leadership. So software companies, any company that's selling a product, you can get a job writing for one of those companies, um, their website, um, and you're learning key still skills such as um, synthesizing information, coming up with actionable insights, and and telling stories. So I think there's there's a lot of opportunity and. And in a way, writing in, in general is, is turning away from sort of the journalistic who, what, where, when, why, which is very much a commodity into the thought leadership model that we, that we talk about. So there's going to be a need for human beings with uh, empathy yeah. and constructive and creative thinking. Uh, don't, don't think these jobs are, are going away. They, there may be fewer, but they're going to be still as important, if not more so important. In sure. a marketplace where You've got to win on the quality of your ideas and your breakthrough thinking. And if you're going to be me too and just try to aspire to do as, as well as your competitor, you're not going to succeed in the marketplace. 
Let me ask you this question. When you graduated Union College way back when, did you think you'd be in the position you're in today? If not, where did you think you were going to be? And how has your career gone compared to your expectations over time? Well, that's a great question. No, I could not have imagined it. I I majored in computer science and basically minored in journalism. I, my dream was to become a journalist, but I never thought you could make a living at it. So I was going to uh, get into the computer field and sort of moonlight as a writer. Um, I couldn't bring myself to do that. So I started writing right away about technology about and then eventually about innovation. So my dream early in my career when I was in the trade magazines with you was to get to you know, the big leagues like a Business Week or the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times. And I did um, go over to Business Week. I think my aim there was to stay in that field. But I got the, bu the bug to write books and, and embark on writing thought leadership as well. And I think that was a turn I never expected. Okay. I remember um, doing my first thought leadership pieces for a now defunct company called CSC Index. And seeing how it was a completely different kind of writing and how it was more valuable because I was getting paid more, okay? And it was valuable for the company and its clients. And that gave me a real critical set of skills that I've been able to um, evolve since then especially with the storytelling piece, because the whole narrative mindset that from my books about history, I applied to thought leadership as well. So I think they really um, dovetail together. Well, that's inspiring. And it's also good to hear that uh, you found your way. It was fortuitous, I think, that you studied computer science way back when. Little did you know that was going to be a guiding light to your career, because not only were you a good communicator and storyteller, but you actually understood the, the, the concepts and the constructs around information technology. So it, it worked out well for you. Well, I remember early on, I would, at Business Week, be sitting, sitting across from Bill Gates, interviewing him one-on-one. -on -one. And when he found out that I had a degree in computer science, he had a, a little bit more respect for me because um, that was very rare among tech journals in the day. So um, he felt comfortable to go off on the bits and bytes. Yeah, and, that's, and, he, and that was very helpful to him because when there was a, a blue screen of death that it, it, he, while he was doing a demo, he could say, oh, that's not a bug, it's a feature. And nobody, right. nobody would know the difference. Mm -hmm. This has been a, a great kind of a discussion that goes not only down memory lane, but also looks a little bit out over the horizon as to where thought leadership is heading and what people should be doing to take advantage of the opportunities. And at the end of the day, while you know technology is sometimes scary and intimidating, if you embrace it, does it, it doesn't mean that you have to worry about it eating your job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thank you so much. Incredible. Thank you so much, Alan. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. Thanks for joining us in Everything Thought Leadership. As Evan noted, getting heard above the thought leadership din comes down to having big breakthrough ideas told through colorful and creative storytelling. We would agree, particularly as people's attention spans get shorter. That's why Evan believes B2B thought leaders must captivate their audience by deploying a storybook or movie-making approach to thought leadership development, regardless of the format. They need to entice the reader with a protagonist, the hero of the story and an antagonist, the villain of the story. That's the best way to get a target audience to lock in and take notice when the villain, aka the problem your company solves best, is vanquished. And showcasing how a firm solves client challenges using mountains of evidence, facts, figures, and case examples is critical. Evan's work on the breakthrough book, Dual Transformation, with the team at innovation consultant InnoSight is a great case in point. The team, which was led by partner Scott Anthony, created a framework to codify how it helped clients transform their businesses amid impending disruption, to solve current business challenges, and to thrive tomorrow. It introduced this framework through client examples first revealed in an HBR article. 
which created momentum for the impending book. As Evan noted, the book was a force multiplier for the firm's business. And how do you know when your book is sustained impact? It's when it influences the world around you. Recommendations made in Speed and Scale, for example, have had an impact on climate policy contained in the Biden administration's Inflation Reduction Act. And when it comes to AI's role in thought leadership development, Evan believes producers of thought leadership and thought leaders themselves should embrace any and all innovations that disrupt conventional thinking and ways of working. And we agree, as long as it's done with human insight and oversight. Thanks for joining us on Everything Thought Leadership. We hope to see you again real soon. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd love it if you'd left a like and share this episode with your colleagues. Everything Thought Leadership is a video and podcast series from Bidet TLP for thought leaders and thought leadership professionals, the people who help experts get recognized as thought leaders. You can find out more about Bidet TLP at bidettlp.com.